everybody. Welcome back to the Film Buds podcast. This is episode number 174. And my name is Henry. And I'm Paul. This week, we're going to be looking back at some uh, early classics. We have a review of Casablanca from 1942. And then we have a review of The Invisible Man, the original Invisible, Invisible Man from 1933. Uh, and then uh, I think after that, we might do some kind of open discussion on, you know, early, early classic film of some kind, just have it, you know, keep it kind of open and, and uh, broad. But uh, so we'll, we'll get to that and maybe save mail and uh, other stuff we watch for next week. Or if we have time, we might do something, but we'll figure it out along the way. Well, Paul, how you doing? Doing well. You know, just been sort of hanging out, hanging on been working on the script it's coming along nicely right now it's at 139 pages Oof. so and i think i've mentioned this before on the podcast but if i haven't uh in screenwriting terms it's usually about like a page a minute as right. as sort of the the agreed upon way that the page is formatted using particular type font and page settings and so forth So I'm looking at about two hours, 18 minutes minimum. Cause honestly, I definitely have enough stuff in there that, you know, could, could easily protract beyond that time. So honestly, I think that I'm looking at a, at about a two and a half hour runtime Mm. right now. So a pretty healthy biteful. (laughs) Uh, How have you been? Uh, I've been uh, a bit. All right. Thanks. Uh, Nothing too exciting this week. Just been, Working and, you know, doing more kind of Air Force prep and all that stuff. So nothing really new or uh, particularly interesting, but uh, doing all right. Yeah. Um, That's great. Yeah. So cool. Well, not a whole lot else to mention, really. Uh, Paul, anything for you? Anything at all? No, not really, I guess. All right. Well, I, I guess we we do have a lot to to chat about, so I guess we can get to our first review, which is Casablanca, and we do have a clip, so take a listen. If you don't mind, you fill in the names. That'll make it even more official. You think of everything, don't you? And the names are Mr. and Mrs. Victor Laszlo. But why my name, Richard? Because you're getting on that plane. I don't understand. What about you? I'm staying here with him till the plane gets safely away. No, Richard, no. What has happened to you? Last night Last we said... Last night we said a great many things. You said I was to do the thinking for both of us. Well, I've done a lot of it since then. It all adds up to one thing. You're getting on that plane with Victor where you belong. But, Richard, no one... I... Now, but... you've got to listen to me. You have any idea what you'd have to look forward to if you stayed here? Nine chances out of ten, we'd both wind up at a concentration camp. Isn't that true, Louis? I'm afraid, Major Strauss, I would insist. You're saying this only to make me go. I'm saying it because it's true. Inside of us, we both know you belong with Victor. You're part of his work, the thing that keeps him going. If that plane leaves the ground and you're not with him, you'll regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. But what about us? All right, so as I said, uh, Casablanca came out in 1942, ages ago, and it's directed by Michael Curtis. And it stars... Humphrey Bogart, Ingrid Bergman, uh, Paul Henreid, Claude Rains, uh, Conrad Veidt. Is that? Uh, sorry if I butchered it there, Conrad. Uh, Sydney. I don't Green- think you have to worry about whether Conrad. <laughs> <or not. laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Sydney Greenstreet, Peter Lorre. Am I forgetting anybody, Paul? Uh, no, those are the big ones for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and the synopsis is. A cynical expatriate American cafe owner struggles to decide whether or not to help his former lover and her fugitive husband escape the Nazis in French Morocco. So this one is, uh, you know, uh, considered by many to be a, a, a true classic. You know, it's on a lot of, you know, best films of all times lists yeah. and, and all that stuff. And uh, was pretty defining film of the era 1940s and yeah well paul you suggested 
we do mm-hmm. this one. Yeah. Would you like to kick things off? Sure. So Casablanca is an interesting one because, you know, way back upon, you know, a time, and it still happens definitely today, you were kind of contracted by the studio and creatives really could spend their whole lives working with one studio. Mm -hmm. And so this was one of the studio vehicles that had kind of a fabled troubled production you know, numerous people wrote the movie. Um, it's listed as three, but I think it's actually more than that that actually ended up touching it and then doing rewrites on it. Mm. Bogart was in the middle of like career burnout at the time. He was being used as a workhorse. And I think that it's also a really interesting movie that's dealing with topical things right in the middle of when it was going on, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, World War Two is, you know, roughly... 39 to 45. Yep. Um, So we're sort of smack dab right in the middle of it all when it's happening as well. So I thought that it would be a really, really good one to go with. I had originally been thinking about, you know, a a horror film separate from Invisible Man or even going silent era. But once you once you picked yours, I was like, you know what? Let's just go in a completely different direction. Let's go Mm. Casablanca. And I'm glad that we did. I hadn't watched Casablanca in, I don't know, probably six years. Yeah. It had been a while for me as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's one that I like to go back to more often than Citizen Kane, which I do about once a decade. And rewatching it, I was, I was pretty satisfied with it you know it it still for me really really holds up it's kind of a long movie compared to um some other movies that were out at that time but i think it does a really really good job of conveying character of sticking to exactly what the story is like no other real deviations Mm. and and making something honestly memorable and rewatchable by modern standards, which I think is a different thing, you know, than just saying any movie is rewatchable. I think that it's one of those rare few that from, from the past that holds up for audiences beyond film buffs. Hmm. Yeah. What about you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I like it a lot as well. I, it's not one that, you know, if we were to do a f- top five, top 10 list of maybe early, early films, it wouldn't really be on that list, I don't think. But I still really enjoy the movie a lot. Um, I, I love the World War II setting. And, and the, of course, the Casablanca setting is is great. And I, I think Ingrid Bergman and Humphrey Bogart are, are great together. And all that stuff has been said, you know, a million times. But I think it does a, do a good job of by the end of the movie feeling very grand and mm-hmm. very romantic uh, in a lot of ways, despite the, the darkness of the story. And uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with it in terms of its rewatchability. And I think that it, it really feels it feels of the time, but nevertheless, it's very accessible. You know, it's not so over the top, like a lot of movies were at the time to where mm-hmm. someone fairly new to, early film would be kind of turned off by it. I think that it's, you know, pretty easily digestible. Um, yeah. And it, it, I mean, of course, again, this is uh, all kind of old stuff, but it, it looks incredible. Like I love, it's very sweaty. I like the look of, of all that. And <clears throat> I think inside the, the bar is great. And uh, just the, the shadows and the light and, and all of that stuff is, to paint it very broadly, it's just very compelling and engaging. Uh, Yeah. And so, yeah, I I think it's, it's a really, it's really worth a watch. And again, it's not one that I would like when I think of early film or I think of my favorites, it's not necessarily there, but that doesn't mean that I still don't really enjoy it. Uh, Just, and you don't have to necessarily list what your favorites would be. You know, we could hold that for later if you wanted. Um, what is it that holds this one back then compared to other older films from being in the top for you? I guess, well, 
this one, I guess the one issue I have with it is in all of the times that I've seen it, I've probably seen it. Did we have to watch it at UNC Greensboro? I feel like we probably uh, did. Probably in at least one class, yeah. Yeah. I, I've probably seen it five or six times, uh, maybe. Uh, and no matter what, I can never seem to get fully engaged with the story. Interesting. Um, and like, I, I feel like I want to care about it more than I do. And by the end, I love the final maybe 20 minutes. But for a lot of the movie, I feel kind of distant from it. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't mean I'm not enjoying it or I'm not entertained by it. But compared to other films within that same era, same genre, I feel like I'm always kind of struggling to get really um, invested fully. No, I completely get that. I think it doesn't help that I think one Rick is a character of a lot of subtlety and he's a guy who as a character is just constantly holding his cards to his chest. So I think that that can definitely be like a disengaging thing. And I think the other big thing is, you know, I think the movie's great. If I had to hang any kind of like, you know, sort of sin on it from my perspective, I think, one of the things that bothers me the most is probably that, um, especially compared to like Laszlo or, or some of the other characters, I think Ilsa is a little underwritten for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think that even though Laszlo gets less screen time, I have a better sense of who Laszlo is, you know, and I have a great sense of who Rick is. But the woman who's traveling in between them is just kind of just that. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's obviously something that happens with older movies, right? You know, mm -hmm. there isn't quite as much agency for everyone all of the time. But I think that that is something that does kind of hinder the narrative just a little bit is that why did she love Laszlo? Why did she love Rick? You know, why is she making some of the choices that she's making, you know, and, and Rick kind of writes off, you know, she came and, and she played her, you know, her her best attempt at, at loving me still. And, and you know, she almost had me convinced, almost, you know. A lot of it is is left up to Rick interpreting it, and it doesn't feel like a lot of her actions necessarily have all of the motivation that um, I think they always should have. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a pretty fair assessment. Yeah, yeah, I would too. I I think that even so, like, as I said, I think the final 30 minutes or so are my favorite. Like I, I think from when Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman get to, I guess it's a hotel or something at, at night. And she's, they're talking about the time in Paris and all of that. I think all of that is great. And I love the look of that scene. Um, and then just jumping ahead to the very end of the movie. I think that there is something so like the, the, the fog, the headlights at that airport, there's just something so iconic about it. And really, it's gorgeously put together, even without the, you know, kind of the famous lines at the end. It's just the, you know, the monologue Humphrey Bogart gives to her and everything is just really, it, it feels like it ha hasn't aged today. You know, it, it's still just as romantic and epic as it, I feel like it would have been at the time. No, absolutely. For me, the ending of Casablanca is kind of an anti ending of Citizen Kane. You know, mm. when I hit the end of Casablanca, it feels so much like the journey that we were absolutely supposed to go on. It feels like the outcome that we've been promised by the movie. You know, it has a certain amount of still being, you know, obviously not after this many times of watching it, you know, it's still it still hits hard and is still, you know, surprising on a certain level, but is also the inevitable choice of these characters. Mm -hmm. You know, the movie really sets it up that Rick is about to kind of fuck over Laszlo, you know, and then it kind of just does this absolute shift on you. And so I think that the ending is, the ending is probably the most iconic part of the movie overall. Um, yeah. And for me, I think that it works great. Whereas something with like Citizen Kane, I think the movie is great up until the ending. And then the ending really kind of hurts that movie for me. Yeah. Um, it was interesting. We accidentally, and I don't know if you noticed this, we accidentally ended up making it a, uh, 
a kind of double feature for one actor in particular. Claude Rains? Yeah. yeah. We, we ended up making it a Claude Rains double feature. And, yeah. um, you know, again, I thought that he was great in, in this movie. I actually even preferred him in this than to his role in The Invisible Man. And I think mm. the reason that the movie holds up is that the casting's great. Character is right there in the dialogue for everyone. It's using great talent that they have at their resources. And I, I think that this is a great example of of what older filmmaking you know, shows what movies were going to be. And I think that that's why Casablanca kind, kind of always ends up making these lists is because it's a much more modern story compared to a lot of other older film. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and also, uh, I was looking at his IMDb page. The, the director, Michael Curtis, he has 179 director credits to his name. Yeah. Uh, right before he did Casablanca, he did Yankee Doodle Dandy. So I might have to give that one a, a poke. But yeah, it, <clears throat> I, I don't know. It's kind of it's hard to to really talk about it because it is just it's such a simple film, but it, it works so well. Uh, now, how do, how do you feel about Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman in general? Their chemistry is great. How do I feel about them in general? Um I think their chemistry is great. I think that she still brings a lot of depth to her character, even if it isn't 100% there on the page all of the time. Uh, and I think Bogart brings one of the best performances, definitely of the movie. And maybe it's because he was dog tired, but but it's a very understated performance. But there mm -hmm. still is a lot going on. You know, you can see that he's a little bit world weary, that there's there's a lot that's being processed in that furrowed brow. And so I think that he manages to bring a lot of depth and a lot of gravitas to the role. This is probably my favorite role of his, you know, I've seen some of his others, Maltese Falcon and, and um, the big sleep and things like that. I think that's my favorite of his big, the big sleep. sleep? Yep. Yeah. And I think that he's great. You know, I think that, I think that, he just constantly has that right kind of raggedness to his heroes. Hmm. You know, he always brings about that kind of I'm tired edge, <laughs> but not in a, in a way that ever makes the, the performance feel, feel tired. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. I, I wouldn't say I'm a huge Humphrey Bogart fan. I've never disliked anything that I've seen him in, but after a while, I feel like he starts to feel kind of, it starts to feel a little bit repetitive across mm -hmm. a lot of his roles. And I mean, there are plenty of actors out there who, you know, do the exact same thing in every movie and they're, they're great at it, but it's, you know, purely a subjective thing. But I feel like in, in the case of Humphrey Bogart, for me, I don't always enjoy him as much as I do other, you know, big actors of the time, like, you know, Cary Grant, Clark Gable and others like that. I feel like Humphrey Bogart for me would be lower on the list. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I I love Ingrid Bergman. I, she's uh, one of my favorites of of the era for sure. Uh, have you seen African Queen? I have. Okay, yeah. I, that's another one that I really like him in. Those are probably my number one and number two character picks for Humphrey Bogart or Casablanca and an African Queen. Bergman, I honestly, you know, I, I've seen her in other things, but but for me, she isn't, I guess, necessarily one of the standouts of the generation. I think that she does a great job. And maybe I just haven't seen like enough of her. Have you seen uh, Notorious? That's my favorite of hers. Yeah, I saw Notorious once quite some time ago. Yeah. So who knows? Maybe I'll go and give it a rewatch. Yeah. And I guess uh, Spellbound. Was she in Spellbound? Was that the one? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Notorious and Spellbound are my two tops of hers. Okay, spellbound. I haven't seen at all. Yeah. Uh, but no. Otherwise, it's yeah. It, it's a film that you know. I think it's very deserving of having such a long shelf life, and and I see why people continue to praise it and put it as you know best of the best uh, for many reasons. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think that. 
you know, it's all, it's almost tricky. You know, there, there are things where it's, it's like, oh, you know, it's almost cliche to say that it's one of the best of the best, but you know, cliche as it is, this is a really straightforward narrative that on a certain level, I think kind of transcends some of the when it, it that story takes place, you know, because if you really boil it down, a lot of that story could have been moved around, you know. Mm-hmm. It's a love triangle about people in a hard time. And I think that that could be, you know, a story that that really endures and carries on. And I, I think that that's probably one of the big reasons that it, it has really endured is just the simplicity of the narrative of the character work of the choices they make and also by not choosing the the obvious ending Mm -hmm. which is that rick gets the girl i think that it really elevated itself outside of just being any other movie yeah and and And, one uh, on that point i will say i feel like it it does a good job for me of at that moment at the end i am always surprised that it's not a happy ending (laughs) Yeah, you know, and I feel like it it, all, it gets me every time, even though I've seen it many times. I'm like, oh, right. And I kind of connects a, a little bit. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's one of the reasons why this movie works. Yeah, is that it doesn't just cop out and go and there goes Laszlo. Everyone wave <laughs> by to Laszlo, you yeah. know. And it's a bold pick for a character, you know, it's it's a hard choice to make your character choose the right thing over the easy thing, you mm-hmm. know, as a, as a person. And, and I think that they managed to lead Rick right to it in the best possible way. Yeah, I agree. <sighs> All right. Uh, anything else about Casablanca, Paul? I think that it's absolutely worth the watch. You know, it, it may be a simple choice of a must have, you know, on your on your watch list of cinema history, but I don't think that that will take away any of the merit of the of the why it's there. And also, I think that it will open up a doorway for a lot of people who consume a lot of media into a whole slew of not only references, but where certain character types and character tropes were sort of born. Because I think that the Humphrey Bogart version of this ultra-reluctant hero is still something that we see in characters like how Hugh Jackman plays Wolverine. You know, maybe that's a little bit of a stretch, but I feel like if you boil down where Hugh Jackman is pulling his references from, probably somewhere at the base of that pan is Rick from Casablanca. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, out of five stars, Paul. You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go five. Five for me. Light yeah. five. Light five. <laughs> um. <laughs> so cool. Well, we can uh, uh, put that one away, and we can get to our next review, which is the Invisible Man from 1933. And we also have a clip for this one, so take a listen. One day I'll tell you everything. There's no time now. I began five years ago, in secret, working all night, every night, right into the dawn. A thousand experiments, a thousand failures. And then, at last, the great wonderful day. But Griffin, it's ghastly. The great wonderful day. The last little mixture of drugs. I couldn't stay here any longer, Kemp. I couldn't let you see me slowly fading away. So I packed up and went to a little village for secrecy and quiet to finish the experiment and complete the antidote, the way back to visible man again. I meant to come back just as I was when you saw me last. But the fools wouldn't let me work in peace. I had to teach them a lesson. But why? Why do it, Griffin? Just a scientific experiment at first. That's all. To do something no other man in the world had done. Okay, so The Invisible Man is directed by James Whale, and it stars Claude Rains, Gloria Stewart, William Harrigan, Henry Travers, Una o- O'Connor, Forrester Harvey, 
Uh, that's about it, I think. And the synopsis is a scientist finds a way of becoming invisible, but in doing so, he becomes murderously insane. <laughs> Pretty good synopsis there. So this one, yeah, I mean, we uh, I, I reviewed the Blumhouse re- remake reboot when it, back when it came out, so you can check that one out if you have interest. Paul, uh, how do you how do you want to? Had you seen this before? Uh, I had not. Oh, okay. This was my first time with this one. Okay. Uh, w- would you like to kick it off or shall I? Uh, why don't you take it away? All right. Uh, so, yeah, I- I've talked about The Invisible Man a lot over the years. It's one of my favorite films, one of my favorite horror films. And a lot of that has to do with the character as he's presented in this film. He's one of my all-time favorite characters across all of art Really, I love the look of the character, the performance, the concept and ideas behind the character, the kind of chaos and terror of the film. He just kind of runs around, you know, mur- murderously insane, as the synopsis says. And it's just such an iconic thing. Even from the first time I saw it years ago, um, I just immediately connected with it. And I I love it, really. And I think that the effects of The Invisible Man are still awesome. Uh, And I think that any scene where he's, you know, just running around in a T-shirt and the rest of him is invisible or he's taking off his uh, bandages from his head and he's invisible under his head or uh, under them is awesome. I I like the setting of the the kind of tucked away town. And yeah, I I'm a there, there are a couple issues that I have with it just for the sake of conversation, but I can get to those later. So. No, of course. Yeah. What about you, Paul? So I had never seen this one. This is, I think it's like the fourth or so of the universal horror films from back in the day. Yep. Um, so once upon a time, dear listener, Universal was not considered one of the five major studios. It was actually one of the minors. And all that they had was production. You know, they they didn't have exhibition as well. They had production and distribution, but not exhibition. And they used this sort of model that came from, a lot of studios did, a German state-run organization called UFA to kind of organize their studio and get people into contract and work with them. And a lot of the early Paramount, or not Paramount, Universal Horror films were handled by people who were heavily inspired by German films that had come over to the U.S. in like the 30s. And also even some of the creative talent were people who came over. The cinematographer of James Whale's Frankenstein was an old UFA cinematographer. Mm. So a lot of the early universal horror films are very based in old German filmmaking and in particular German expressionism. Some of those roots are definitely still here, but they're definitely lessened with the invisible man. And James Whale also directed before this Frankenstein. So this movie's interesting where we're very early on in the days of sound on film, mummy Dracula and Frankenstein are some of the first sound films um you know we're early into this whole franchise uh of horror films that ended up lasting in kind of two waves in the early 30s and the late 30s and ultimately i liked it a lot but i actually had the issue of not really feeling as connected to these people as i wanted to Hmm. Um, and the claude rains performance as the invisible man is definitely for me one of the highlights of the movie, especially compared to some of the performances of other people, you know, I think there, that this, there's one performance I will get to that is brutal. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I, I think that I can guess who it is, but, but I'll keep it, I'll keep it tucked away until you, until you tell it. Okay. No, I, I think that even though I liked a lot about this movie, this was one where I was like, you know what? It's it's about 30 minutes l- shorter than Casablanca. And I was like, I don't need all 30 minutes, but I could have maybe done with like 10 to 20 more minutes of maybe before the accident. Hmm. 
you know, before the invisibility. I think that I could have used a little bit, a little bit more there. I do agree that it's an incredible technical marvel. I looked up how some of it was done. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously the, the physical stuff was all done by wires and simple mechanics and stage hands off screen. But how they actually did the invisibility stuff was a really, really, really technical process that pioneered a lot of, uh, a lot of techniques that we use now. So I think that it's a really, really interesting movie, and I, I wish that I liked it more, hmm. is my current stance. Not that I disliked it. Right. I wish that I just liked it more. Hmm. Have, you, uh, have you seen all the other major uh, Universal Monster films? I've seen Dracula. I've seen uh, Frankenstein. And that's about it. Okay. H- h- how do uh, those compare? For me, I actually Frankenstein is my favorite. Okay. James Wales Frankenstein is is definitely my favorite overall. Okay. okay. Um oh and just to kind of spoil it here, the performance I was talking about was the barmaid. I knew it was the woman <laughs> was, who runs that bar. <laughs> if I had <laughs> any complaints just for the sake of conversation, her scream is the most nails on a chalkboard over the top headache inducing thing I've ever come across. <laughs> and that's just her whole performance. Yeah. Just upset woman is her entire performance. Yeah. And also because of the time, the sound work that it sounds like her scream is tearing the screen itself. It's so yeah. scratchy and uh, it's the worst. And I remember, I wish I could remember what else I saw her in, but I saw her in something else over the last couple of years. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> she did the exact same thing in another film. It was just her screaming that exact same way. So that is not I would I wish I would love to see a fan edit where they just cut all her out. But I don't know if that's going to happen anyways. So uh, but like in terms of sequences themselves, I love the look of the opening scene in the snow where he comes in. He's wearing the coat and, and all of that. Yeah. I, I like where. He's terrorizing the town uh, and he's in his T-shirt running around the room and, you know, hitting the police officers, uh, riding the bike. And it's a, you know, he's invisible going through the the town, the scene where he's outside the bank throwing the money and all he sees is the, the floating money tray. And yeah, I, I just love like I just I can't kind of overstate it. I, I just love the look of the invisible man, especially when he's in his bandages and he mm-hmm. either has some kind of trench coat on or like a robe on. I love the glasses and I love the look of the bandages. Um, and especially if he has his hat on, I just, I could look at that all day really. And I've seen, I've seen pretty much all of the sequels that, I mean, Claude Rains wasn't involved and they're okay. They're not amazing, but um, there are some, some cool moments in, in those films as well. But this one, I I kind of agree about the runtime. I do, in a sense, love that it's only 70 minutes. I think that's kind of cool. But also, Mm -hmm. you know, I guess having seen it many times at this point, it would be kind of nice to see more. I I wouldn't necessarily need to see him before, but maybe just more scenes of either him doing more random chaos and terror or more scenes of him explaining the situation. I think I just need one scene of of him before just to do, do two things for me. One, to show the charming man that this woman loves. And two, showed how he went crazy. Right. Because if this is the only character that I know, for me, it's a little bit harder to wrap my head around the idea that he was once a nice normal guy. Sure. I think it's kind of the same issue that like Stephen King has with, uh, with the shining with Jack Nicholson. It's like, he seems too much like the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a movie that we watched for movie history. I'm blanking on the name. It was about a dad in the suburbs and he takes cortisone, which is like a, a very simple medication Mm -hmm. and he ends up going completely 
fucking crazy and like beats his wife and um this is like an up, old an old film it's 70s huh. 60s 70s and it's a it's a ultra wide movie they've got the lens on it that has the it's it's shot on super 70 and it even has the lens that causes the slight uh disruption yeah where straight lines start to to fish out right and we watched it, I think, in film history. And it's about this dad who goes and takes a medication and goes completely fucking batshit. And even though that movie overall is is not that great, being able to see A and then seeing who he transitions to B, you know, is is a much more satisfying journey than starting out with just B and then trying to find your way into empathizing with him i think mm. so i definitely liked it a lot it, it was just it was one of those things where i felt like i had to do more work to find my way into enjoying it mm. as opposed to even some of the old classic monster stories i think uh, and i think that his design is great and like there are definitely parts of the movie that absolutely captivate me Mm-hmm. You know, there I sound very negative. There are definitely parts of the movie that have me locked on. Like mm-hmm. his first arrival. Oh, yeah. I was so interested. I was like, oh, where the fuck are we going? Like, this is this is yeah. pretty weird guy walks into a room. Where's it going to go? Um, So it's definitely, I think, a rougher, older film for me. But I do think that it's one that is is super worthy of minimum at least that kind of you should watch it for the history mm-hmm. buy in. You know, you should one hundred percent watch it not only for Universal's history as a horror studio, but also for the work that went into making this movie because it's 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 a technological marvel mm. on every level. And also just because the Invisible Man rocks, Paul. <laughs> no, yeah. Claude Rains does a great job with the part. Um, yeah. He's the best part of the whole movie, probably, cast-wise. Yeah. I, like, I like his laugh. He has a good um, kind of maniacal mm-hmm. laugh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all that stuff I, I agree with. I think that I, maybe it's because it's the time that it came out. I'm a little more, I guess, more forgiving or or something along those lines of why there's not more there. I, I kind of just like that. It's so simple and so quick uh, in a lot of ways. And so I, I kind of like it in a way that's more streamlined. If, if this exact same thing came out now, perhaps I, w- I wouldn't feel that way. But I think just having come out in the early thirties, I, I kind of just, I go with it, uh, yeah. you know, but I, I get that, that criticism for sure. And also, I don't know if I would ever or not ever, but, I don't know if I, I fully empathize with the, his character. I'm not like sobbing. I'm so you know sorry this is all happening. But I just, for whatever reason, I find him very compelling and interesting. And a lot of that might be performance. Uh, I, I don't know. And the look as well. But I, I don't know. I just, I, it's some it just kind of inherent thing. I, I just, I think he's such an interesting character. And I enjoy some of the twists that some of the sequels take, even if they're lesser. And I also really enjoyed the the Blumhouse one, mm-hmm. even though they do away with the original design. Have you seen Hollow Man with Kevin Bacon? I haven't, but I've heard people it's a similar, telling me to watch that. Yeah, it's, it's an Invisible Man story. But I think his transformation of Invisible is like a slightly slower process. It's been a while since I've seen that movie. But Hollow Man, if you really enjoy Invisible Man stories, yeah, could be one that you enjoy. You could also go and look up 2003's The Erotic Misadventures of the Invisible Man. <laughs> I might have to. <laughs> <laughs> Lazy Sunday kind of movie. Mm-hmm. Um, right after church, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go and put on the erotic adventures. <laughs> so long, everybody. I've got plans. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck um, Sunday school. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, also a few few other scenes. I love the scene where he's shot at the end, where he's you see the footsteps mm-hmm. and then he's shot and you see him, the impact on the ground. And then at the, the, the final scene where you see him come back to visibility. 
And uh, also, uh, random question, Paul. I mean, I've said my, if I had a superpower, it would be invisibility. What would yours be? Telekinesis. Okay. I feel like it's a very um, pocket knife kind of power. Mm. <laughs> you know, can't. Ah, uh, shit. I locked myself out of my house. Let me just use my telekinesis real quickly to just kind of, you know, sure. force the lock open. Oh, I don't feel like driving. Let me just fly somewhere. You know, mm. I feel like it's a really, really useful power. It's, um, it's, it's the everyday needs of that. It is. It's an all arounder, you know, just when you think it won't come in handy, it will. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. Um, so yeah, it, it's, you know, uh, it's my favorite of the monster films uh, of the early monster films. And Have yeah. You, I, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no. I was just going to say, I, I, I love it. <laughs> Have you looked into some of the, how they did it? I, a little bit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So to, to really basically explain it to viewers once upon a time, you know, you couldn't just upload your footage into a software editor click on the green have that color taken out and replace it you know with whatever your image was you essentially had to go and take a film strip and mat out for example where um the matte painting was going to be so essentially for like a whole a uh, whole series of film strip you would go and you would look at it and it would be vacant there would be this entire sort of nebulous space taking up part of each individual frame. And then you would have to go through and create a series of frames that had the matte painting backdrop. And then you would have to put them together and re-expose them and create this singular image that was originally a two film strip process. Right. With the invisible man, they did that same kind of concept, but what was happening was they were going through, they were filming one image Filming vacant images, filming uh, rains in the set, but everything was covered in black velvet, mm -hmm. except for certain things that needed to be visible. And then he was going through and doing that. And then anything that needed to move through the scene was matted out. So it was four strips of film that then ended up getting composited together into a singular experience. Yeah. So that's what they were doing all the way back in 1932, 1933, mm. which is insanity when you think about the fact that, you know, just a decade ago, they didn't even have sound on film. Yeah. So a lot of very early techniques that we use now, you know, are, are all the way based back in the earliest days of filmmaking. We've improved upon them and made it easier technologically, but at their core, a lot of them are still very much the same kind of idea. Yeah. Professor Paul, just laying it out. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. I love research. <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah. So the, the, the effects are awesome. And one thing that I, I love personally is like, you could call it a flaw, but I like watching it and be, being able to see little mistakes, like when he's taking off his, his mask or the, the bandages and you see little bits and pieces of the outline or little like dark spots where it's clearly them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I kind of like it, especially uh, for the time that it came out. I kind of like seeing that because it reminds you like, oh, yeah, people actually had to do that, uh, you know, by hand, so to speak. Um, yeah. And so. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Also, one thing I will say, one of the sequels has a scene where there's an invisible dog. The invis invisible man has an invisible dog and that you just see this harness dog harness walking around and it's terrible. It doesn't hold up at all, but it's <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a clever idea. So, mm -hmm. yeah, well, um, cool. A anything else about the invisible man? No, honestly, I, I think that that does it just about does it. it. It's one of those that has a lot of, to borrow a phrase from theater, back of the house acting. Mm. 
You know, it's one of those where even though there's a camera right there, a lot of these people clearly come from a world of the back of the theater needs to see it. (laughs) But I think if you can get past that and some of the other issues, you know, that, that just come with a movie aging, I think it's definitely worth the watch. And also, if you don't want to do all of the whole universal horror franchise, I think minimum doing the first of each of them is a worthwhile experience. The first Dracula, the first Frankenstein, the first Mummy, the first Invisible Man. Because we're looking at things that shaped an entire generation of of not just movie makers, but also storytellers. You know, one of the reasons that the first characters or images that Stephen King's Pennywise turns into in the book, It, is the mummy and the Wolfman, and things like that is because it takes place in the 50s. These are the movies that are playing on TV. These are the things that are terrifying a generation. And I think it's interesting to go back and look at what people consider fearful. You know, what taboos are being tapped into, what ideas are being tapped into, what makes someone once upon a time go, that makes me afraid. And I think that that's a weird place to look, but I think that it's an interesting place to look to find out more about who we were. Yeah, well said. Uh, and one thing interesting, that uh, kind of random about Dracula, one cool thing about that movie is there's I don't think there's any score in the movie aside mm-hmm. from the very opening credits. And so it's cool to watch a movie like that that relies entirely on... Uh, you know, performance on on mood, but it uses no score. And mm-hmm. but then, if you think about movies now, like horror movies now, the score is like a essential part of creating. Um, I mean, s- some directors use it uh, too much, but uh, it's typically a thing that direct directors rely on to create. Yeah. Uh, you know, unsettling sequences. So it's it's cool to go back and be like, wow, they're not even thinking about using that they're using so many other elements of it no absolutely it's also i think worth noting that even if there are any flaws that you may have with the movie at the end of the day this version of the movie is what the writer of the invisible man story hg wells signed off on Mm. you know so even if you don't you know think that this is necessarily the definitive version and maybe with time it isn't but for a time, even by the writer's own standard, like this was the tale. Yeah. Oh, and the, the book is awesome, by the way. I've read the book. The book is very oh, okay. Good. Yeah. I have not read the book. I have read Dracula, you know, with its diary entry format. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Out of five stars, Paul. It's a three five, and a half. Th- three and a half. Mm-hmm. It's a five for me. <laughs> Okay, um, you just had a great time with this episode. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I guess I'll watch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, all right, well, I guess we can move on and just kind of get more into er, you know, early classic film as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, so, of course, we, we could talk for years about this kind of thing, but Paul, any, any certain areas, anything that while watching these two movies that struck you as something you uh, wanted to discuss or, you know, are there any, I, and I guess we can also talk about certain favorites as well. Um, are yeah. there any standouts to you from the early eras? Trying to keep it in the theme of everything before 1960. I would, yep. I would say so as well. Yep. You know, obviously some of the, some of the obvious musts, you know, Citizen Kane, Casablanca, duh. Pretty much anything Chaplin does is probably worth a viewing. My first silent movie was actually The General. Oh, yeah. Which is a Buster Keaton film about a guy in the Civil War who is in love with a woman. And essentially, he goes to her father and is like, let me marry your daughter. And he's like, no, you're an absolute ninny and a sissy why on earth would I ever let you marry my daughter? And he's like, okay, then I'll join the war. And he's not a very good soldier, but by absolute, you know, happenstance, he ends up 
in pursuit of and destroying um, a southern tank or a southern train right um, called the general and it's a it's a really fun little movie I think that re-watching old films is beneficial for everyone for a lot of reasons I think that for people who love film it is a must I don't care if you go to film school it is a must that you engage with where the art form came from it Mm. is necessity you don't have to go to college and then make movies but you do have to know where the fuck movies come from I guess so (laughs) (laughs) So I think that that going back and reviewing old movies, you know, for this really reminded me of that. I think that for people who are casual viewers, it's a great way to just expand your palette. You know, not everything that's older is bad or outdated or outmoded or irrelevant to you. Mm. Just older. <laughs> um, and three, I think that it can help you kind of build some patience back as a viewer. I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but there are some times where I watch something and I'm like, why am I having a hard time with this? Especially, you know, something older. And I'm like, why am I having a hard time with this? And it's like, I went into it with the mindset of being entertained by movies in the, in the context of a more modern movie. Do you ever have that kind of sensation? Sometimes, yeah. Even with something that I've seen before sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's all about mindset, you know, and kind of thinking about the context of it um, mm-hmm. for sure. And and Paul, one thing I, I, before I forget, it would be an, an interesting experiment for you to be teaching a class and me to be one of the students and see how I hold up against your... <laughs> <laughs> Just to see, uh, you know, how I would analyze a film as opposed to how the teacher would. It'd be a, a this now. This would be a very long form experiment. It but would. It be, could have yeah. interesting results. It could. Yeah. Um. We'll have we'll have to look into something like that. That could be. A, <laughs> yeah. Could be a good way to figure some some things out. How do how do you feel? I guess about older films. Are there any standouts for you? Yeah, I mean, I I I really love watching older films and I feel like recently I haven't been watching as many as I, I, I have in the past, but I always enjoy it. I, I, it's, you know, and I, I guess I can, I can really say like, I'm not one of, one of those people who will say, Oh, this classic film is so good. I, I, it's, you know, one of the best of all time. And then I don't actually enjoy watching it. Like if I watch a film, even with context and I don't enjoy it, I'm not going to praise it. Uh, you know, just because it's considered to be a classic, but like with the, you know, silent film, as you were saying with the general, I, I love Chaplin. Uh, I, I love all of the comedians and it's so, there are a lot of them as well that are so, I don't know, um, underappreciated that are mm-hmm. incredibly, they're incredible. Like it, it's just, you know, like there's one that's called thief. I think it is. And it's about two hours and 50 minutes long. And it's this espionage film, and it's amazing. It's mm-hmm. like you you got to sit with it. It's a two hour and fifty minute silent film. Like it's not an easy watch, but like there's such incredible art there, and there's so many because it was um, that era was truly like breaking the art form out into the world. There are so many interesting experiments that people tried. Yeah, some succeeded, some failed, and it's so cool to see both some that really work and then some that are like, this is not good. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, but that doesn't mean that, that it's not interesting to watch. And so silent film is, is awesome. You really got to be in the right mindset to watch it and to enjoy it. But like, it, it's so worth watching and, you know, kind of going, going through time, so to speak, you know, each era and seeing the differences. And because again, it's such a new art form that yeah. they're just trying whatever the hell they can think of to be new. Uh, with the you know the technology of the time and so i mean standouts i I mean of course we could you know go on and on about that the invisible man would be up there for sure i think my i think psycho is my favorite 
quote unquote classic film, early film. Um, I love Some Like It Hot with mm-hmm. Marilyn Monroe. I'm a big Marilyn Monroe fan. Rear Window is another for me that I really enjoy. Now, how do you feel about some of the classic epics like Ben Hur, Ten Commandments? Are 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 those that you ones that you enjoy, uh, or are they kind of yeah? It it very much depends. The historical epic ended up getting swept up in this movement of studios kind of just spending ludicrously on sets and extras just to kind of make an epic. So some of them get a little bit dry. Yeah. Um, but some of them are definitely worth the watch. Honestly, out of the sort of historical epic era, I would say that the best of them is probably Spartacus. Mm. If I had to come up with like a top five of black and white movies that I think everyone should watch, it would be Citizen Kane, Casablanca, Some Like It Hot, M, which is a German film. That's great, yep. And then probably Frankenstein. Yeah. Oh, oh, and uh, I don't know if I gave a fifth one. East of Eden is another one of my favorites with uh, James Dean. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a wider it's a wider field than I think most people realize, even going back to silent film, you know, there are westerns. Westerns were one of the first things done in silent film. Um, westerns actually had like a little bit of an ebb out in the thirties, uh, and and if I'm not mistaken, going into the forties. It wasn't really until stagecoach. Um, that Westerns had like a resurgence. So you can find a lot in classic film and you can find a lot that you still relate to in classic film. And also, and this is the thing that, that I, you know, am, am constantly saddened by whenever I think about it for too long, there, there are constant films that were good that are also now just gone. Hmm. You know, because a studio basement flooded or because the studio never held on to the print and the person who had the print put it in their garage and then they died and their kids found it and their kids put it in their garage and now it's rotted away. So I think that even more importantly, like absolutely treasure the classic films that we do have because it was a long way for them to get here in a weird way. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, and I, I talk about it a lot sometimes, like, especially going back to like 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, just watching something f- to see footage of that time is interesting yeah. to me. Like seeing, you know, a 1917 film and just seeing how people acted or, or yeah. how people thought, what acting was at the time, what people thought was funny or not funny and, Mm -hmm. or what people thought were, you know, was dramatic or sad or, or whatever. And so it's cool to just see buildings of the time and, and to see people, how they looked, you know, Uh, because there are so many differences, uh, not even discussing makeup, but just the look of people at the time uh, was, was different. And, and now in terms of like comedy, you know, uh, I think, you know, people like Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin, you know, their stuff, again, I'm not just, you know, blowing smoke. It's like, if you sit down and watch those, to me at least, they really are funny. I'm not just saying, yeah. oh, yeah, that's a classic comedy. You should watch it. It's like, there are, I mean, there are flaws to those films, a lot of them. But like, when it's funny, it's really genuinely funny. It just as I would laugh at something that came out yesterday would be, you know, yeah, um, just in a, you know, it's done in a different way. Uh, and 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 that's also the basis for a lot of Jackie Chan's philosophy about yeah. how a moment is supposed to land and about how physical comedy is supposed to work. Mm. It's set up punchline and payoff just yeah. without a single word uttered. Yeah. And, and I think my favorite Chaplin film would be The Great Dictator. I love that one. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's, you know, and now what about in terms of 1960 or before, do you have a favorite era 
For me, it would be the 50s. Um, I would probably say the 40s. Okay. I really like 40s film. I love noir stories. I'm a huge noir fan. And some of that did obviously continue on into the 50s, but a lot of that was born in the 40s. You know, you get Touch of Evil, I think, is like 49 or 59. Mm-hmm. No, I'd probably say the 40s. Okay. What What about directors? Um, Probably Chaplin. Okay. Chaplin or, and now I'm going even older than Chaplin, George Melies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I think the 50s for me, I love film noir as well. What would be your, if you, some film noir, like, are you like dub, Double Indemnity? Are there any any standouts? Uh, double Indemnity is definitely one. Touch of Evil, like I said, is a great one. It takes place in like a, a Texas border town. So it's kind of a little bit of a change up of scenery for film noir at the time. And it's a really big touchstone for um, the Coens as yeah. well m obviously um which is a film noir from germany kind of that the defined the genre the postman always rings twice the big sleep yeah yeah i i think you know alfred hitchcock it's kind of like the boring choice i i do love hitchcock i think billy wilder would be my other top one uh, mm-hmm. and he yeah he did some like it hot and double indemnity and oh and another film that he did that would be a favorite of mine is Sabrina with Audrey Hepburn. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I really love love that one a lot. Um, in terms of actors, I, I love Cary Grant, Marilyn Monroe, Audrey Hepburn. Greta Garbo is one that I, I always love to watch a lot. And what about you? Any, any actors, standout actors? Um, I love Hepburn. She was a... Um... She was a uh, resistance operative during mm-hmm. World War II, mm-hmm. um, and she ended up carrying messages in the toes of her ballet shoes. Yeah. That's a, that's a fun fact for you. She also cared for the director of the first Bond movie, who was a paratrooper that ended up falling behind enemy lines during mm-hmm. World War II. That's what I think we also have to remember about a lot of the people that we discuss in you know, sort of 20s to 30s filmmaking and then 40s to 50s filmmaking is like 20s to 30s filmmakers, a whole shit ton of them had survived World War I and were very heavily influenced by World War I. And World War II, you get the same thing with that next sort of generation of them. Um, Yeah. Bogart's probably a favorite. Cary Grant's fine. Jimmy Stewart Uh, would, would be another for me. Jimmy Stewart is is pretty solid, some more so than others. I'm not a big Mr. Smith Goes to Washington fan. Nor I. <laughs> um, Chaplin is probably one of my favorite older black and white actors, um, just because that's a guy who really understood his character. And, you know, he really did just have one. It was the tramp. Um, but he did that one well. I like some early John Wayne. Um, you know, some black and white era early John Wayne performances, I think, are pretty solid. He's got like a kind of middle section that gets a little spotty, but like some early stuff and some late stuff for him are great. Mm. Uh, oh, and a- another thing you that you're touching on, and also uh, in terms of the directors, like, for example, Jimmy Stewart was a fighter pilot mm-hmm. uh, in World War II. And then also, and there's a great documentary, Paul, I don't know if you've seen it on Netflix called, I think, Five Came Back. Yeah, uh, and it's about some of the big Hollywood directors who went and filmed, who took time away from Hollywood and went and filmed World War II battles, made mm-hmm. them into films, and then presented them to the American public. Like John yeah. Ford was one, um, mm-hmm. and, and a few others. But like, it's kind of interesting to think about. That's not something that m- most directors would do now. But like huge, yeah. big time directors took time away from, you know, making huge money makers to doing these very important infomercials, you know, so, mm-hmm. so to speak. And, and a lot of those are actually on Netflix. Now you can watch like, like I think there's like battle of midway and things like that, that are, it's purely just a director going and filming a world war two battle. You know? Yeah. And there's nothing else to it. It's just, just action. 
Um, well, and it's um, I think it's Frank Capra. Yeah, that's one. Um, who's another great old director. Um, and he was tasked with coming up with propaganda films and he couldn't figure it out, you know? And so he asked for, this is something that you learn in the documentary. He asked for German propaganda films, Nazi propaganda films. And he was like, well, this is the most terrifying shit I've ever seen. Let's just put this in English, Mm. you know? So it's a really interesting documentary if you're, if you're into both world war history and also entertainment history, because it also pretty much every filmmaker has one modern filmmaker dedicated to talking about them. Right. Um, So I think it's Capra that's talked about by Guillermo del Toro Mm. primarily Um, Steven Spielberg's in it. So it's definitely like worth a check if you're, if you're into the cross section yeah of those two points yeah so yeah that's that's a really interesting point about about the era that's uh, you know is should be appreciated for sure and yeah i mean you know it's classic film is is great and i feel like you know even just having having watched these two films for this this week i feel like i want to kind of go and explore some more films that i i haven't watched yet uh and maybe even some silent ones. You know, I've kind of been in the mood for that. Um, the German officer of Ca- uh, Casablanca. Mm-hmm. That's the uh, zombie figure from Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. And, and also speaking on that, yeah, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu are cool. I think Nosferatu would be my favorite of the two. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, if you want to, you know, explore silent film or, or or classic film, you know, you don't have to start with Citizen Kane or something really dense. Just watch a comedy or something, and you you'll you know see bits and pieces and different pathways that you could go down, and before you know it, you're hooked. Paul. Yeah. No, I, I'll I'll completely agree with that. Filmmaking is all about finding what you like across a very, very wide set. And, you know, that's why it's always ridiculous to just completely write off a whole genre. I don't watch that kind of film. Mm. Why? Mm. Well, because it's this, not all of them are that, you know, yeah. if you look at and you go, I don't watch old film. Why? <laughs> it's boring and old. You've literally just neglected thousands of titles you know, that that you could find the thing that really sparks some kind of artistic inspiration in you. Um, yeah, I, Paul, I don't watch anything that was made before the year I was born. <laughs> <laughs> there are people that are like that. It's just Yeah, oh, befuddling. I know. I know. It's befuddling. And there are also people who I've talked to, bless them, that like call like a movie from 2000, uh, 2001, like a classic film, like an old film. And I'm no. like, you have no idea none your mental we're we're talking about uh an art form that's over a hundred years old yeah you know no i i i adore watching old film and honestly if you're not enjoying old talking films maybe go back further yeah go back to silence yeah and and also one thing with silence i mean sometimes it worked sometimes it didn't because like they were kind of experimenting like pacing is a weird thing with silent movies. Like sometimes movies would be an hour long. Other times they'd be three and a half hours and like the pacing is all over the place. And so generally, you know, the comedies are pretty streamlined, pretty short, pretty easy to watch, but it's more so when you, when you get into like epics and, you know, espionage thrillers that you're getting to the more, there might be some ups and downs with how you're viewing it. Um, yeah but you know that's just again being uh having the awareness of the time no absolutely hell if you can get through a three-hour blockbuster now and enjoy it you know no reason you can't uh do it with you know 1920s film well and and you're gonna get a crash course in what it is to tell a story visually yeah you know yes there will be the dialogue cards but they have to tell you they can't just keep flashing those. You'll never get a fucking image in 
otherwise. Yeah. And, and you and might really, as well read the book. Yeah, and really, I prefer films, silent films that have the least amount of title of dialogue cards. I really prefer just watching it, you know, visual. Yeah, for the most part. So, yeah. Well, anything else, Paul, in particular about a uh, early film, and we can always come back to it at some other time. Um, no, I, I I think that I've I've hit my points pretty eloquently. If if you're only watching modern films, you're only watching part of the story, mm. because at the end of the day, this is a a generational thing. It is handed down from one to the other directly indirectly doesn't matter it's it's as much of a lineage you know as as any other art form and so i think that if you're if you're watching modern films you're only getting half of the story because you know some of the greatest filmmakers working right now were inspired by what they had access to so if i wind the clock back to when edgar wright was a child you know edgar wright had Silent films, black and white sound films, and early color films, and whatever was in theaters at the time. You know, so we're 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 going back and we're informing ourselves on how we got here. And like Henry said, it's also a great window into how people just were. You know, if you go and watch some of the early Lumiere films, you just get to see some people just being back in the late eighteen hundreds. So there's a lot of value to going back to old films and maybe it'll be a little tough for you, but maybe you've also been a little bit spoiled in your viewing habits. Sure. Uh, yeah. And you know, skip, put aside the Frasier reboot. All right. <laughs> skip it. You don't need the Frasier reboot. There's nothing in it for you. Put it aside and watch a silent film or something. You know, watch a Chaplin <laughs> film. No, that movie that you've seen 20 times, that TV show, Mm. that you can delay Friends a a little bit. You've already seen it five times. You know what? Skip the first season and use however much it would have taken you to get through that to watch something new. Yeah. And I don't mean new. I mean new to you. Yeah. (laughs) So... All right. uh, Well, Paul, what do you want to do? You want to call it a a day or do you want to end off with some picks of the week? Uh, We can do some picks of the week. I also do have a real quick. I remembered that I didn't answer your question that Uh, you posed about who I would want to direct. uh, And I came up with an answer like literally right after we ended last week's Mm, episode. Yeah. yeah. So who would I want to direct my script uh, that I'm currently working on? I finally figured it out. Edgar Wright. Hmm. It's he said his name seems to pop up more often than not. So I uh, that's that's a good choice. I, I would Edgar, if you're listening, we have a script for you. <laughs> no, I think that he'd do a great job. Um, you know, I thought that Ant Man was obviously a story that he put a lot of things in place, and I I I love how the things that are obviously from him turned out in that movie, even with him not being at the helm. I think the Cornetto trilogy is great. I think Baby Driver is great. And I think that he handles genre mashing really, really well and, and genre blending really, really well. And I think that he would lend himself well to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, and I'll say, I, I do really like Edgar Wright, but I really prefer him when he works with Simon Pegg. Okay. I, I don't love films like Baby Driver and Scott Pilgrim. I love the Cornetto trilogy. So I think when okay. they work together, it's prime. But, well, cool. Yeah, that's a, a a solid choice. And he has a new movie coming out soon. Yeah, Last Night in Soho. Yeah. Which is a title of a song. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, Paul, do you want to... Uh, what you've been watching? So, I watched... the. I've only watched three movies since our last episode. So, Ghostbusters. Nice. The Ivan Reitman one. Yeah. from uh 84 Jurassic Park oh the classics mm-hmm. and in the heights the new uh musical I saw that as well I thought it was just okay 
exactly how I felt. <laughs> my wife hated it a lot more than I did for innumerable reasons. Mostly is essentially that they changed plot elements that just brought the plot for her very much down and made it a very unfocused movie experience for her. Yeah. She felt it overcomplicated, a very simple narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I had no real knowledge of the play uh, aside from Lin-Manuel Miranda, who I do like a lot having been involved in. I felt the exact same way. I thought, uh, so it's directed by the guy who did Crazy Rich Asians, which I was not really a fan of. This is a little bit better than that. It's very bright and, and energetic, but I thought there are so many parts of it that were just unintentionally goofy. Like yeah. the writing was off. The performance was off. Um, I liked the dancing and the singing, but I think that they could have done more with not cutting constantly during the dancing. I think it uh, should have been more yeah. singular, one take, continuous shots and all of that. Um, another great thing about classic film, w single one takes, you know, like Top Hat and and all those. And yeah, just very goofy, like just and not like in a good way, even for a musical. I thought there were parts of it that I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, a great example of of the too many takes thing is um, or too many shots and and cuts in a in a sequence is when Benny and Nina are having their shot. They're, they're having this discussion inside of the, the cab dispatch, and it's the two of them separated by maybe two to three feet of space. And he's trying to convince her to hop on the radio and start doing call-outs to the cabs. Mm. And instead of just doing a, a profile shot where we existed with these two kind of being fun and flirtatious where we could have seen how they're playing off of each other. We do like shot, counter shot, shot, counter shot, shot, counter shot. Yeah. Really, really rapidly for two people essentially just talking to each other. And I know that it's through song, but like, it's very, very fast on yeah. a level that I'm like, this makes Marvel editing look tame. <laughs> yeah. Uh and like also, and I, it feels very John, is it John Chu? I think his name is. Mm -hmm. um, get rid of the like Nintendo Wii-esque animation stuff that they did. Like these weird little like falling, I don't know even what to call it. Like these little weird things like where she's connecting the subway line on the fence. All that My stuff. My wife called them Scott Pilgrimisms. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Yeah, like get rid of that stuff. And yeah, so I, I still it was charming. It was light on its feet. I, I like that about it. But I I don't seem to like it as much as a lot of people seem to. No, I've seen much better musical adaptations yeah. overall. I've, yeah. I've just seen better musical movies. Oh, yeah, easily. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with you there. What are what are your picks of the week? Uh, yeah, so I have a few things I was kind of burned through. Uh, I rewatched Sicario, the first one, which great movie. I absolutely love. I think it was in my top five or top ten list of the 2010s. Uh, just amazing. Rewatched Dodgeball, which is you know just a fun comedy. It's, it's I've seen it a million times, but I, I it's just easy watch. Uh, rewatched Rat Race, which oh. uh, is a is a classic. There are parts of it that are a little don't hold up totally, but it's still so wacky and yeah. am ambitious in a lot of ways. It's just entertaining. Yeah. Rewatched Children of Men. Another great one. Is uh, amazing. That one shot, that one continuous shot towards the end is incredible. And yeah, so many interesting ideas and messages in that movie is great. Uh, Rewatched Fight Club, which I still enjoy to a certain degree. It's would be lesser, lesser Fincher for me. I love Brad Pitt or I love the whole cast really, but there are parts of it that feel too nineties, too needlessly cynical. And, but still kind of, again, another wacky ambitious movie that I enjoy to a certain degree. Rewatched kingdom of heaven, the director's cut roadshow version, which is like three and a half hours. And I absolutely love kingdom of heaven. I think it's, it's, I mean, I, I'm a big Ridley Scott fan, but I, and I love medieval epics, but I think this movie, especially the director's cut is very underrated. Paul, have you seen this? Uh, yeah, a long time ago. It's been a while, but that's one that I would be interested in going back to for sure. 
I saw it in theaters with the theatrical cut, and then I saw the director's cut on home video later. And I remember really enjoying that. So I'd like to go back to it. Yeah. And and also, it is weird to think about how many huge movies Orlando Bloom has been in. Like, Yeah, he's got the weirdest career for like me. Pirates of the Caribbean, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit franchise, you know, movies like this. It's cr- like more so than many other actors who seem to be praised and always talked about. He's been in a crazy amount of huge, successful, iconic movies. Yeah. Not to say this movie is iconic, but, you know, I mean, you, you could call it that. I don't know. It's a big movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's an and, epic and there's no getting around that. Yeah. Uh, and I f- believe that is it for me. Okay. That's yeah. a pretty good, that's a pretty good group. Yeah. Been, been busy. Oh, I started watching the Harley show, the Harley Quinn cartoon. I've, I've seen the pilot of that. I liked it. Yeah. The pilot didn't sell me 100%, but I have enjoyed it the further into it I have gotten. So I think that if if you're not sold on it, maybe go and get a few more in and maybe you'll like it better. Yeah. How do you feel about Kaylee Cuoco? Yeah. Meh. Because I, I, I like her in Big Bang Theory. I haven't seen uh, The Flight Attendant. I've heard pretty good things about that. Uh, I think her her voice performance in this is good. I don't know. I mean, it's... I don't have major issues with it. It does the job. It's not my favorite show. And it, and she is not my favorite Harley. Hmm. But I just think that it is one of the better things that they have put out. And it's one of the things that I have put on lately and been like, this was a worthy diversion of my time. Yes. Uh, yeah, I felt the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I'm, I've been wanting to go back and, and watch more. So cool. Well, Paul, anything else to mention for you? No, I think that just about does it. All right. So yeah, I guess that is about it for the show. Sadly, this week, uh, Paul, any ideas for for next week? No, literally zero. Okay, (laughs) perfect. That's the way I like it. So yeah, well, is there anything new coming out that we could do? We'll uh, look into that. Yeah. So we yeah, kind of open ended for next week. If you have any ideas, the, the film buds podcast at gmail.com is where you can reach us at also Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at film buds. So you can follow us there if you haven't yet. And the film buds.com and all that stuff is in the show notes. If you need more clarification or spelling. Um, so yeah, well, great. Well, Paul, I mean, thanks as always, man. It's always nice to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you, man. It's, it's always great to be here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, keep me updated about the script. Best of luck with all that stuff. Yeah. Um, honestly, I would expect um, an edited version probably tomorrow. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, we uh, hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>